Well, I want to invite you to turn in your Bibles once again to Acts chapter number 20, uh, Acts chapter 2, verse number 22. Acts chapter 2, verse number 22. Last week, we celebrated Easter, the resurrection day uh, of our Lord. But I, I want to finish uh, the, the sermon that I started then because this was, uh, it, it, we were only able to cover just a very, very limited portion of uh, this massive message that Peter gives on the day of Pentecost. And what a tremendous message it is as we look into it. You have your place in Acts chapter number 2 and verse number 22. And we'll read there down to verse number 35. It says, Ye men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man proven of God among you by miracles and wonders and signs, which God did by him in the midst of you, as ye yourselves also know, him being delivered, by the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God, ye have taken and by wicked hands have crucified and slain, whom God hath raised up, having loosened the, the, the pains of death, because he, it was not possible that he should be holden of it. David speaketh concerning him. I foresaw the Lord always before my face, for he is on my right hand, that I should not be moved. Therefore did my heart rejoice, and my tongue was glad. Moreover, also my flesh shall rest in hope, because thou wilt not leave my soul in hell, neither wilt thou suffer thy Holy One to see corruption." Thou hast made known unto me the way of life. Thou shalt make me full of joy with thy countenance. Men and brethren, let me freely speak unto you of the patriarch David, that he is both dead and buried, and his sepulcher is with us unto this day. Therefore, being a prophet, and knowing that God has sworn by an oath to him that of the fruit of his loins, according to the flesh, he would raise up Christ to sit on his throne. He, seeing this before, spake of the resurrection of Christ, that his soul was not left in hell, neither his flesh see corruption. This Jesus hath God raised up, wherefore we all are witnesses, Therefore, being by, the, uh, being by the right hand of God, exalted, and having received of the Father the promise of the Holy Ghost, he has, he has shed forth this which ye now see and hear. For David is not a, uh, ascended into heaven, but he saith himself, The Lord said unto my Lord, Sit thou on my right hand until I make thy foes thy footstool. Let's pray. Father, once again, I do thank you for your word. And Lord, I ask God that you'll help us as we come before you. Lord, I pray that you would uh, give us liberty to be able to speak. Lord, give us remembrance. And Lord, that you would have your will. I do humble myself before you, realizing I'm just a man in need of thee. And Lord, I pray, God, that you would do greater and mightier things than, his, uh, than the ability that I have. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, last week, we looked at the first result of, of the, uh, of the uh, resurrection. What, did the, what was the result of the resurrection? What did it cause? Well, the first thing that we looked at was that death was conquered. Because the fact that Jesus Christ rose from the dead... Death is conquered. That ought to make us rejoice. Everybody in this house ought to be saying, Amen, Hallelujah, Glory to God. I mean, that ought to make us want to raise our hands right there because of the fact that death has no power on us. Death is not something that we're to fear. But can I tell you this right here? <laughs> that that's the one thing that we fear the most. It is. I mean, we'll, listen, I've, I've watched people die. 
I've watched people die, and I've watched people die, and they always want just a little bit more time. Always want a little bit more time. I remember uh, Miss Betty uh, George, and she was, she was passing away. I went to her the day before she actually passed away, and, and, and we were praying, and, and I, asked her, I, I asked her, what would you like me to pray for? She said, I would ask for one more day, but she said, then I just have to ask for another one after that. But the truth is that we're, we're, death has been conquered for us. There, there's no sting in it. That's why the Bible says that, oh, death, where is thy sting? There's, there's nothing that holds us in death. Victory was won. The result for us is that death has been victoriously put down. And we are to be shouting hallelujah for that. Amen. But there's a second result that, that is given to us, and that is that the Word of God is validated. The Word of God is validated. God, in the Old Testament, has exalted His Word above His name. God said, I lift high my Word. God exalts His Word throughout the Scripture, and He seeks to validate His authority by His Word, by its inerrance. By its inspiration. And he does it many, many times in many ways. But none greater than by prophesying. And God gives us prophecy. And then when we see that prophecy come to pass, it, it concludes that God's word is true. That God's word will not fail. That God's word will always stand. A.T. Patterson uh, said this, that there's over a thousand prophecies in the Word of God that has, that has come to pass, and none that, that has not. Amen. And all these can be verified by history. God speaks, and when He does, it is true. Isaiah chapter number 46 and verse number 9 says this right here. Remember thou, uh, remember the former things of old. For I am God, and there is none else. I am God, and there is none like me. Declaring the end from the beginning, and from the ancient times, the things that are not yet done, say it. My counsel shall stand, and I will do all my pleasures. God predicts the future. Aren't you grateful for that? That God has already given us, in the Word of God, predictions of the futures that we can see. That's why, that's why Jesus said, can you not tell the time? Can you not see the seasons? And every time a prophecy comes to pass, God's Word is validated. God's Word is validated, made true before us. And this is precisely what Peter is saying in verse number 25 when he says, For David speaketh, con uh, speaketh concerning him, and that's the Lord Jesus Christ. I foresaw the Lord always before my face, for he is on my right hand that I shall not be moved. This immediately takes us back to Psalm 16. Where David made this prophecy. David spoke concerning him. That is Christ. He said in Psalm 16 in verse number 8. I have set the Lord always before me. Because he is at my right hand. I shall not be moved. David is saying the Messiah would come one day. And the Messiah would focus his attention all on the Father. And never take it off of him. And because of the Father, and because of that, the Father would stand by him and make him stand at his right hand. Nothing would ever come into his life that would move him from the, the plan of God. In other words, David prophesied that the Father's protection and security would be on the Messiah. And the Messiah would continually be at the work of God. The Messiah would foresee the Lord as it was Christ. And the Father would 
view his life and bask in his faithfulness to him. And David is saying the Messiah will keep his focus on the Father. And the Father will keep the Messiah. In Psalms chapter number 16 in verse number 9, it says, Therefore my heart is glad and, and my, my uh, glory rejoiceth. My flesh also shall rest in hope. The Messiah will come and go into the grave. He will go into his grave because he has hope in the Father that he will stand at his right hand. The Messiah will not be, will not be <laughs> suffered to die and, and to be placed in the, in, in the grave forever. No, death will not hold a victory on him because there is joy that is set before him. And that joy is the resurrection, the hope that he has. Can I tell you, we have that same hope today. Can I tell you that we have the hope that, that Jesus had? That's why the Bible says that we have the hope of, uh, it, is, it is in, uh, I forgot where it's, where it's mentioned that, but it says that, that we have the hope of salvation or the helmet of salvation, which is hope. That one day that we'll be with the Lord Jesus Christ. We don't have to worry about the things that happen to us on this earth because of the fact that our hope is not here. Our hope is there, steadfast. Just like Jesus' hope was steadfast in, in God that He would not suffer Him to stay in the tomb. The Messiah will, was willing to suffer and die for the joy that was set before Him. In Acts chapter number 2 and verse number 26, it says, Therefore did my heart rejoice, and my tongue was glad. Moreover also my flesh shall rest in hope. Oh, how or why was, would the Messiah trust the Father? Why would the Messiah be willing to rest his body in the grave? Why would he have confidence of a resurrection? Why did he know that the Father would take him all the way through? It's because of what he says in verse number 27 of Acts chapter 2. He says, because thou wilt not leave my soul in hell, neither will thou suffer thy holy one to see corruption. In other words, God's word says that the Messiah would not uh, be suffered to stay in hell, but be risen from the dead, uncorruptible. His soul would never be left in the grave. He would rise from the dead. The word of God says that. And the word of God saying that and predicting that gives us a validation that God's word is true. And I tell you, it's easy for us to look at the word of God and say, yes, God's word is true concerning the resurrection. But what about God's word concerning me and tomorrow? We find it harder for us to believe what God's going to do for us tomorrow than what God did for Jesus Christ. Even though Jesus Christ proves that God's word is true. Oh, how we are to be able to stand knowing that His Word is validated. How His Word stands fast and never fails. He would rise from the dead. In Acts chapter number 2 and verse number 28, He says, Thou hast made known to me the way of life. Thou shalt make me full of joy with thy countenance. Christ knew that he was going to come out of the grave, never corrupted. He would never remain there. And he would be placed at the right side and on the right path of life before God. And at the countenance or the full joy of the countenance of God. He says, thou shalt make me full of joy. With thy countenance. He would go right into the grave and right out the other side. 
face to face with the Father once again, like it was in the beginning. He would be with him again. Jesus had no fear of the grave, for he knew what God had promised. Can I tell you today, there, there should be no fear for us because we have a promise of God too. There should be no fear for us in the way that, in the life that, 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 that's before us because we have a promise of God that He will never leave us nor forsake us. That one day that He'll come for us. That one day that we'll be where He is. We have the promise of God also to be able to stand on, even as our Lord Jesus Christ did. Can I tell you that that's why the Bible says that He's our example? That's why the Bible says that, that he, is the, he is the example that we're to have in our life. Because he was the one that, that believed the word of God to the place that he did. Some people say, well, the, this prophecy that is given in Acts chapter number 2 and verse number 29 concerning David. He said that that's just David prophesying of his own life. That's, that's just David saying that, he, that he's, going to, he's going to raise again one day. Well, there's a, there's a slight problem there if you look at verse number 29 of Acts chapter number, 20, uh, Acts chapter number 2. It says, Men and brethren, I, let me freely speak unto you of the patriarch David, that he is dead and buried, and his sepulcher is with us unto this day. He said, you've got a problem if that's what you believe in because David's still dead and buried. I can take you to the grave. As a matter of fact, if you go to Israel today, you can go to the grave where he is buried. And you can see the tomb is still there. He's still there. But David was pointing not to himself, but he was pointing to the Messiah. He was revealing the prophecy of the Messiah. In verse number 30, it says, Therefore, being a prophet, and knowing that God had swore by an oath to him. Aren't you grateful that God keeps his promise? That he's, he's not talking about David, but he's talking about, the Bible says in verse number 30, the fruit of his loins, according to the flesh, that he would raise up Christ to sit him on his, on his throne. It wouldn't be David. It would be the seed of David, the fruit of his loins, the Messiah. Oh, that, he rose from the dead. That, that is the validation. God's word is validated. What, do you see the importance of the resurrection? For us, death is conquered. For God, his word is validated. It's proven. It's true. We can trust it, we can stand on it, we can believe it, we can live it. But there's another result of this resurrection. And that is that Christ, His person is exalted. His person is exalted. Verse number 33 of Acts chapter number 2 says this right here. He says, therefore being by the right hand of God exalted. Jesus came out of the grave and finally ascended up into heaven. And Hebrews chapter 1 says, God placed him at his right hand. Aren't you grateful today that he's at the right hand of God? And he is there and he is making intercession for me and you. He is there on our behalf, being the great high priest that he is, and making intercession on our behalf. Every single one of us. Do you know that because he's there today that we can approach that throne boldly Amen. with every problem that we have, with every care of our life. We can boldly come before him. In Ephesians chapter number 1, Paul writes that when God raised Jesus from the dead, he gave him a place above all principalities. All powers. All dominions. Do you realize that? That he's not only exalted, but he has been placed above everything. There's nothing that's above him. 
There's nothing that's ever going to catch him by surprise. There's nothing that's ever going to overthrow him. He's always going to have the ultimate, ultimate power of all things. Oh, and knowing that, and knowing that he's our great high priest, how much more confidence should we have? Knowing that he is exalted, how much more confidence should we have in life? Christ has been exalted, lifted up, seated at the right hand of God. He is the one whom God has given the keys of death and hell. He is the one that angels will bow down to. He is the one that demons will fall, uh, that fall prostrate before him. He is the one that, uh, whom every creature in, their, in all the universe will bow someday. Oh, this could never have been David. Verse number 34 says, For David is not ascended into heaven, but he saith himself, The Lord said unto my Lord, Sit thou on my right hand until I make thy foe thy footstool. The promise was not to David, but to the Messiah. And Christ was exalted. He was exalted. Jesus, if Jesus is still in the tomb, can I tell you Satan is still on the throne? The serpent won. Jesus did not do what Hebrews chapter number 2 and verse number 14 says. In Hebrews chapter number 2 and verse number 14, it says that he destroyed him that had the power of death. If Jesus did not rise, Satan won. Satan would be the winner. And you know what? We'd all be damned. But oh, thanks be to God. He rose from the dead. He's no longer there. You can go to the empty grave. God's word was validated and Christ's person was exalted and Satan was defeated. In 2 Timothy chapter number 1 and verse number 10 says this right here. It says, but is now made manifest by the, uh, the appearing of our, our Savior Jesus Christ who hath abolished, abolished death and hath brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. And so Peter says the result is that death is conquered for us. The result is that God's word is validated. The result is that Christ is exalted. But oh, there's one more result that's given. It's found in verse number 33. It says, Therefore, being by the right hand of God exalted and having received of the, of the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he hath shed forth this which ye now see and hear. Can I tell you that the, the Holy Spirit has been shed forth? The Holy Spirit has come. He has risen, He has been exalted from up on high, and the Holy Spirit has come. The Bible says, back in John chapter number 7 and verse number 39, it said the Bible says that the Spirit could not come because Christ was not yet exalted. But as soon as Christ came through the grave and ascended up into the Father, the Spirit of God, the work of the Spirit of God, was a result of the resurrection. The truthfulness of the, of the Scripture depends on the resurrection. The working of the Holy Spirit depends on the resurrection. The victory over death depends on the resurrection. The resurrection is the key to all things of time and eternity for all Christians. 
If there is no resurrection, then we are dead in our sins and damned forever. But aren't you grateful God's word is true? Christ didn't lose. Satan didn't win. The Holy Spirit is in the world. The resurrection did happen. The results are true. The resurrection is, and the results are complete. And Christ has been exalted. And Peter says, in this we rejoice. In this there is joy. In this there is victory for us. And he says this right here. In Acts chapter 2 and verse number 36, he says, Therefore let all Israel, all of the house of Israel, know assuredly that God hath made that same Jesus, who ye have crucified both Lord and Christ. What a sermon he preached that day. What a sermon he gave them. He declared unto them the, the greatest thing that was for all mankind that Christ had rose from the dead. Because in that, for all that believe there's victory over death. For all that believe the Word of God is, is faithful enough that we can trust and live by and, and, and apply it in our lives. And knowing that, that, that Christ has been exalted up, that we have a, a great high priest that we can go boldly before and ask the things of God. And that the Holy Spirit is given to be our guide, to be our seal, to be our proof of salvation. Oh, can I tell you, the, the results of the resurrection are so great that when we think about resurrection, many times we don't even imagine all that it attains. What a sermon he preached. And I'm going to ask you just for a moment with your head bowed and eyes closed. As we close this, this message in this morning, you might have not known Christ in your life. You might not fully believe in your heart that God raised Him from the dead. And you might not have confessed Him as Lord and Savior of your life. But right now, as you sit there, you can do that in your heart. You can ask God's Spirit to come in and open your heart and receive what Christ did for you on the cross. The victories that he gave because of what he did. The forgiveness of sin that, that is there for us. Because he rose from the dead. You can ask and, and you'll have that assurance, that eternal salvation. If you'll simply pray in your heart to God. God will hear it, and He'll answer. And you can be born today. And it's all because of the resurrection. Because the resurrection holds the key for all believers. Father, I thank You for Your Word today. Lord, I pray that you would help us. Lord, that you would help us to, to think much of the resurrection. For all that it attains and all the power that it held. 
and all the things that were revealed through it. And Lord, I pray that there's one here that doesn't know you as Savior. If there's one that's listening that doesn't know you as Savior, Lord, I pray today would be the day that they would receive you. That they would make you Lord of their life. That they would humble themselves and realize that you're the God of salvation and that they're a needy sinner. And in all humility come before you and ask forgiveness and receive that which you've done. And Lord, the work of salvation is only a work that you can do. I pray that you would have your will. And I ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.